Hey everybody, this is the Demolition Man from Venom Inc. And you're watching Josh's Metal Mondays. I mean, it, it's kind of uh, taking our breath away a little bit. Uh, um, I mean, you know, we uh, about eight years ago, um, I got a call. I was working for a production company doing uh, staging, hydraulics and stuff because I'm like a systems engineer. Okay. Um, and um, and uh, I got a call from uh, Jeff from Mantis who said that uh, he'd uh, played the show with his band and Anton, Cronus's brother, was playing drums for him. And they they recorded, uh, uh, or they played black metal at the end of the show. And uh, someone videoed it and put it up on YouTube. And they said they got on it. And people were going, wow, you two should get the Demolition Man and you should do like an alternative version and do something cool. So they thought about it. And, uh, and then... Jeff called me and said, you know, do you want to do it? And I said, you know, to be fair, I got a real good job now. I'm kind of focused on that. The music thing, I'm, I'm not doing so much now. So I don't know if, if I did it, you know, I have to do things like 100%. I don't do things like 20%, 50%. I, I either do them completely or not at all. And so I thought about it and I said, okay, well, if you're serious, then let's do it properly. And uh, it's going to mean something. So we agreed to do it. And uh, the first thing we did was start recording. And then we went out on tour. And over the eight years, we covered pretty much of the globe and had several releases we did. And, and uh, Empire uh, of Evil, we called it, which was a kind of anagram from Prime Evil. Um, was still, we were doing pretty good. We were quite happy and things were moving along. I had tried to get us sorted on uh, bigger labels, and Nuclear Blast was one of them. So I became good friends with uh, Yap at Nuclear Blast and some guys there. Um, but they kept saying no. They weren't interested. It was too old school. And I was... Oh, fuck that. In my head, I was trying to define what fucking old school was because I, I, I even spoke to Monty Connor, who had... Uh, before he left Roadrunner in New York, I even spoke to Monty, and I said, Monty, you know... What's, what's wrong with the material? He said, nothing, it's cool. And I said, yeah, but why, why is nobody interested or biting so hard? And he said, you know, because it's too old school, Tony. And I said, but fucking hell, that's like saying ACDs are old school yeah. or, or Metallica's old school. I said, you know, but they're still successful. I, I don't quite understand. And he said, well, it's just not what people are buying at the moment. And I said, you know, mark my words, the world's going to change because vinyl's going to make a comeback and these bands... You know, the next generation want to hear them and see them. They haven't had the opportunities that they had. I said, you know, I can even see a time where Sabbath would read to her, the original Sabbath. And he said, well, it's a nice dream, but I think that's all it is. <laughs> and five years, five years later, the world turned upside down. So, you know, we'd been pitching and, 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 um, and then we got an offer to play a festival called Keep It True, which is a retro festival in Germany. Uh, the guy who runs it, Oliver Weisshammer, saw me play a show with my uh, my former band. And um, and he was at this festival, a retro festival. And then he wrote to me and said, I really enjoyed the show. It was great to see you do that album, uh, an album I released in 85 called Future Warriors. He said, uh, you know, have you ever played the album? I was to that before you came on. Uh, well, he said, you know, have you ever played the album in full before? I said, no, that was the first time I ever played the album. And um, and he said it was great fun. He said, look, you know, I do this festival, keep it true. It's all about the fans and the music. Would you come and play as Empire of Evil? I said, yeah, sure. He said, but, uh, but I've got a request, a special request. If Abaddon just happened to be in the audience, what's the chances of him joining you on stage and you guys playing a few Venom songs? So I said, well, I think it's highly unlikely, but uh, but I can have a word with the with Mantis and Abaddon and see what they want to do. Well, Abaddon said yes straight away, and Mantis said no straight away. And I thought, oh, fuck. <laughs> so um, you know, we then talked about it and said, look, this is not 
uh, a band band. This is we'll just do this for the fans. We'll pick a handful of songs, classics, and we'll just have some fun. So that was the intention. We had no rehearsal. We each picked the five songs. Uh, me and Mantis flew in from Russia. Uh, Abaddon flew in from England, and we met for the first time in like twenty odd years or something. They keep it true. Oh, and shit. then we just went on stage and did our thing, and two thousand people went fucking crazy. With and, no um, rehearsal at all. Huh? With no rehearsal at all. Not none whatsoever. That's and and, and awesome. Mantis Jeez. had picked up some kind of disease while we were in Russia, so he, <laughs> he doesn't even remember it. He got wow. to a, he got to a, he got to one of the solo parts, and halfway through he stopped, and I went across. To check he was okay and he said i can't remember what what am i doing and i went i don't give a <laughs> fuck anything you want so he um but yeah we just mashed it together true venom style and just boom we just exploded on stage and uh and we came off and it was fun we we met i don't know how many fans we did a signing which they said would be 20 minutes to sign albums and stuff and after an hour and 10 minutes Oh, the promoter, uh, the, they were just saying, guys, you've got to stop. And I said, but we can't. Look, there's still people need stuff signed. But anyway, the next morning I got up and my fucking media went nuts. I ha I was getting uh, promoters, agents, managers, uh, everybody just hitting me going, you guys have to tour. And I, I was trying to say, we're not a real band. We're not a band. <laughs> nice, um, And so I went to breakfast at the airport with the guys. And I said, look, this is what's just happened. What do you want to do? I mean, we've got a choice here. We can do fuck all and go home and just carry on what we were doing. Or we could say yes and just spend a year touring. And uh, we decided to say yes. And since that point in the last 18 months, we haven't been able to down tools. Every time we figure, oh, we'll just have a rest. We get more offers and just go fuck it, pack our bags and go again. And so, it, we eventually had John Tazula, uh, you know, famous for Megaforce, Metallic Anthrax. Um, and he'd been an old time buddy. And he was the guy who first took Venom to America uh, at the Paramount City with Metallica opening. And, uh, you know, I threw somebody to go help. What the fuck are we supposed to be doing here? And so <laughs> I, I said, maybe you'd get involved, John. This was about four or five years before. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm not doing that shit anymore. No way. But, you know, if you need advice, just always talk to me. And then last year, we hit uh, America twice. The second time, we played in uh, Florida, in Orlando, at the end of the tour. And that's where John Suzula now lives. He's from Jersey, but he's now living in Florida. So I sent him a message, said, John, please come to the fucking show and come and say hi and stuff. But he wasn't feeling so good that day, but sent one of his guys down from his company, Breaking Bands. And um, I got back about two weeks later. He called me and said, my man was there. He said, you guys fucking blew it to bits. He said, OK, I'm on board. What should we do? And I was like, oh, my God. And the next thing we know, we've got agents and we and then Nuclear Blast. We had several labels were interested to hear something. Um, and about a month ago, I went to Rome for a few days. And then I went straight to uh, uh, Portugal, where Mantis now lives. We put together the four demos, the four songs uh, for a demo and threw it straight to John Cezula. And almost immediately, Nuclear Blast went, we want it. Nice. And that was it. Nice. And hey. Uh, it was just great. You know, the first time we played there was, um, I guess, about five, six years before with uh, Onslaught when we toured as Empire of Evil. Okay. And when it was fucking packed in there and um, halfway through the set, my microphone stand bust uh -huh. and there was a, a, a black kid, metal kid in the audience right the front of me and he grabbed a hold of the mic stand and held it up for me. So I picked him up onto stage and he stood there for the whole of black metal holding the mic stand for we tried to head back. Fucking hey, man. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, when we went back to St. Vitus, we did two nights there and with Negrovic. And when we went back there, this guy came up to me this, and he went, and he's, of course, he's, he's a bit older now. And he went, hey, man, you remember me? I went, fucking hell, do I remember you? You saved my life. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it was wow. like being an old friend. It was so cool. So cool. Yeah. You so made that kid's fucking, that's something he's never going to forget. Yeah, it was awesome. That, the funniest thing was he was holding the mic. He was holding the mic, but as he was head banging, the mic was getting lower and lower. So I kept up <laughs> right his hand and pull it back up again. <laughs> just brilliant. Just brilliant. You know awesome. what's the thing is that um, we've we've been we played so many places in America. Um, I mean, we we the, the the three or four tours we've done have been like you know forty shows, thirty shows. So we've done like in almost two hundred shows in this in America, uh, but we played you know uh, uh, um, small places, bigger places. We did Webster Hall, St. Vitus, you know. And we played the Midwest and 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 obvious places uh, up and down the East and the West Coast, uh, through Texas. You know, we've really, really travelled, and 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 it's meant a lot to fans because you know you play Chicago, of course, people can go, but you also can play St. Louis. So we've been able to access everybody everywhere, which yeah. has been so good. <laughs> I mean, I think that's it. You know, and the, uh, 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 the American fans tend to look at European festivals and they, you know, they don't get the same kind of things happening in the States. But, you know, there is festivals in the States. There's uh, the thing in California that Glenn Danzig does. There's Maryland Death Fest. You know, there are festivals that do happen. Um, it's just not as many and not as high profile sometimes as... You know, we're very jealous of the fucking Europe festivals, man. Oh, yeah. Them fucking... The, the bill on those just... I read them and go, oh, my God. I know. Well, yeah, you, you, you look at Brutal Assault or Vacan or Hellfest and, and Bloodstock and, you know, these things are like... It's just a pleasure. You know, over three or four days, you just get everything you could possibly do and I, all yeah. kinds of payments and stages and everything you know i i think initially when ozfest began um uh, you know i thought this is brilliant a traveling festival that was exactly what was going to happen and and it didn't kind of work out like that which was a shame you know because i think there was a real opportunity there to do the same kind of things so you know mm -hmm. um i mean slipknot have tried they have their kind of fest not fest and you know, Metallica even tried some kind of festival thing up in California there. And I, I think it's begging out for it because everywhere I go from, you know, Minnesota to Idaho to Portland to fucking, you know, uh, and New Orleans, you know, fans mm. all say the same thing. They go, ah, oh, fucking, we're suffering, we're missing it. But it's like, you know, the, 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 the army, the legions of, of metalheads in America, and which they don't even realize you know, the strength of that together. And it's like, it just needs somebody to put some real shit together. And, you know, you guys could have festivals coming out your ass. It's just getting that yeah. organization, you know? I think sometimes it's also that promoters looking at things like that, think only about, are we going to do a business enterprise that's going to make a shitload of money? Maybe at first it won't, but eventually it will. But just invest in the kids in the music and make it accessible for everybody, and all the bands will want to do it. And that's yeah. exactly what's happening now. It's a it's a cultural revolution. Mm. And when you have people denouncing it, it's like fucking hell. That's like you know, your dad listening to your music going, "What is that shit?" And yeah. he's, Dad listening to his music and going, Bill Haley, what is that shit? You know, <laughs> on it goes. There's there will be a point where you walk into your kid's bedroom and go, What the fuck is that shit? Because <laughs> that's just how it happens. Yeah. It all has value. It's it's just the natural it progression. Value. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's natural progression. And the people who understand it are the people who are involved in it, and that is the culture. The youth culture, you know, they're the people who the tattoos have meaning. You know, I said to uh, doing like kind of documentary thing on on uh, alternative uh, uh, um, art, really, and how it's connected to you know famous uh, sculptures like uh, David or Venus de Milo or the Mona Lisa, and saying, look, you know, if I walk down the street, an old lady walks down the street with her bag. 
She's just got some money from the bank and she's clutching a bag. And as she sees ahead of her, there's one guy standing who's got a shaved head, covered in tattoos, smoking a doobie, uh, and Doc Martens on. And on the other side of the same uh, sidewalk is a guy who's got a, you know, a Gucci watch. He's leaning against a nice sports car. He's got Italian leather shoes and a nice Italian leather jacket. Which one is she going to lean towards so she doesn't get robbed? She's going to lean towards the really nice smart guy. He's the con man. The other yeah. guy, I know who he is. He's got his whole world tattooed on his skin. He's hiding nothing. That's who he is. The other guy's hiding everything. Yeah, you true. Know, guy, I never looked at it that way. You know, the, the, with the whole, yeah, you're tatted up. What do you, yeah, you ain't hiding nothing. Yeah, that's a really cool no. way to look at that. You, 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 uh, you know, you say who you are by what you do, how you dress, what your music is. You, you're, you're, you're being an honest individual. You know, you're not the criminal. It's the guy, it's the guy you go to see in the bank, the guy who looks smooth and smells of the nice, expensive aftershave and talks the shit to you. He's the guy who's going to put his hand in your wallet. And fuck you. <laughs> if I have a, if I have a tattoo of a, um. Oh fuck! My brain's even fucking losing it now. What the fuck was his name? God damn it! I can't even remember. Fucking Ed Gein. Don't say Donald Trump. No, Ed Gein. I have a I have a tattoo of his victim uh, sewn together across my face. Brilliant, brilliant. I, I I think the old lady would walk across the street from me. <laughs> what she might, yeah, she might do. But then again, what is what is the 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 meaning of that? You know that that then tells you. You know you can see. You can you can see straight away the, where your interests lie and whatever you know. What happens when people find out that, that look Jeffrey Dahmer? What was the first thing they all said about Jeffrey Dahmer? Wow, he seemed like a nice, quiet boy. Yep. And I mean, you yep. know, he, what did they say about you know? Uh, um, we had a guy here, Cranley Gardens uh, in London, uh, uh, Dennis Nielsen. You know, worked in a bank, met guys in a bar, went home, killed them, ate them. You know, and he lived in a residential street not far from me. But people oh, all said, like, he seems such a nice guy. He'd stop and say hello. You know, if you know, if you come walking in like you look like uh, the guy of Friday the 30th with a ski mask on, people would know what you were doing. It's yeah. not that guy. You know, yeah. it's the guy. It's not the guy who has Ed Gein tattooed on his skin. It's the guy who doesn't have Ed Gein tattooed on his skin and will help you take your trash out and do your lawn. <laughs> You know, he's the guy that's eating your cats and your dogs, you know. And, uh, <laughs> it is that, true, man, because be, yeah. most metalheads are very nice fucking family-oriented people, you know, like generally good fucking people, man. I don't it's, think I've, you know, of course, you know, like every group, you got your assholes, but. Oh, yeah, but that's just human nature, isn't it? Yeah, human nature. Right. You know, we played a show. We played a show once um, um, that was in America, and my brother-in-law was working in the city, maybe in Atlanta or something. He was working, okay. and um, he was there with a buddy of his who was they were working on a project. And he, I said, we're going to be in town. And he was like, no fucking way. Same time, can I come to the show? I said, of course you can. So him <laughs> and his brought his friend to the show. My brother-in-law is not a metalhead. And his friend is was even less a metalhead. And they, after the show, they came out and went, man, that was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And I said, you really liked it? They went, yeah, but what was really strange was looking at the audience, they looked all mean. And then it started and they went fucking crazy. And we were shitting ourselves thinking, fucking hell, they're gonna, they, somebody's going to get killed here. He said, but then we saw some guy they were going crazy, slamming into each other. Some guy fell down, and they all stopped and helped him back up. Mark and it. Said it, was, it was like the weirdest thing to see. And I said, because we have a sense of community, it's our release, and, and that's what we get to do. We get to scream as loud as we can. We get to release everything so that when, you know, when I did punk rock, when I was in, uh, did my punk band stuff, I like to go to the most extreme gigs. And when I was performing, I I also performed as extreme as I could, you know, kind of, kind of the Iggy Pop type of way or, or, the, or the nasty Ronnie, you know, I didn't cut myself and stuff, but I was a fucking a nutcase. Um, and when someone said, why do you encourage that kind of extremity during the shows? And I said, because if people come to the show and they get to do whatever they want and they release themselves completely, 
when they go home, they're not going to rob an old lady. They're not going to, you know, give their mom a load of a bad mouth. And they're not going to fight with their brother. They're going to be go home and be happy. And if you come out of a Slayer show or a Slipknot show or a Napalm Death show, or I just saw Gnostic Front the other day after 20 or 30 odd years, fucking brilliant. But every single person coming out of the show had the biggest smile on their face. Okay. Oh, yeah. So they're not depressed. Yeah, they're not looking to burn the buildings down. They were smiling. <laughs>